good. So what we're going to get into with this video is we're going to get into uh, writing and naming compounds. And we're going to specifically focus on ionic compounds. Ionic compounds. All right, because what an ionic compound is, uh, once again, uh, uh, an ionic compound is between a metal and a nonmetal. All right, so if we pull up our little fancy periodic table, it's basically going to be elements on this side of the periodic table in groups one and two, bonding with elements on this side of the table uh, in groups 16 and 17. All right, and so that's really what we're going to focus on. Uh, obviously, you're like, well, why not 18? Because remember, 18, they got a full outer shell already. All right, they want to be like those. All right, so... Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on writing and naming ionic compounds. Now, writing them is going to be a little bit trickier, but naming them is going to be easier. So when we look at ionic versus covalent, writing an ionic compound is a little tougher, but naming them is super easy. All right, and so we'll, we'll get into this. All right, so what we're going to do, all elements in a given group have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. We should already know that. Elements in the same group must gain or lose the same number of electrons in order to have a full outer shell. Metals are always going to lose electrons. All right, they just always will. Non-metals will always gain. So our metals, these are going to lose electrons. All right, over here, our non-metals, these are going to gain electrons. All right, because once again, that should make sense. These are closer to having a full outer shell if they lose them, because right, they only have one or two in their outer shell. They're not going to gain six or seven to have a full outer shell. These are close to having a full outer shell, so they're going to gain. All right, and so that shouldn't be... That's shocking. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use the oxidation numbers. We already talked about how to find these. All right, so number of electrons an atom has to gain or lose is called the oxidation number. All right, so we're going to go through and we write down the oxidation number. Remember, the oxidation number is how many it needs to have in order or what the charge will be once it has a full outer shell. So fluorine, remember we said to find this, fluorine here, it's one space away from the nearest noble gas, so it needs to gain just one electron so it can be like neon and have a full outer shell. Yeah, that's what I want. So it's going to have a negative oxidation number, remember, because it has to gain an electron. Once it gains that electron, it's not negative like it's losing something. It's, it's neg it has a negative charge because it's gaining a negative charge. It has to gain one electron. All right, negative one. All right, chlorine. Look at that. Oops, same group, same thing. Chlorine, negative one. All right, as well. I have to gain that negative charge. Remember, our metals are going to lose electrons, so magnesium, all right, where I'm writing these down at is over here. So magnesium has two in its outer shell. All right, its nearest noble gas is neon. Right, in order to be like neon, it has, once again, magnesium has 12 total electrons, and in order to be like neon, it has to lose two to have 10 electrons. So magnesium, once it loses those two electrons, it will have a positive two. Right, a positive two. It's got to lose two electrons. It's got to lose two electrons. That's what the ion will become. It will become positively charged. All right, and then uh, oxygen. Oxygen is two spaces away from the nearest noble gas. It's got six in its outer shell, but if it could gain two, it would be just like neon. That would be so cool. Oxygen has two. Uh, so silicon, I'm not going to go into silicon. We're not going to. We're going to stay in just group 16 and 17. Sulfur, same thing. All right, and then I've gone over aluminum too. So we're going to mainly stay on our edges here, just to make it even easier. All right. So using oxidation numbers, so we're going to we're going to write a least common multiple when writing a formula. That's called an empirical formula. All right. I'll get into that later. I'm not going to spend too much. Whoa spend too much time on that. So here we have a sodium oxide. So if sodium and oxygen were to bond, well, once again, let's think about this. Sodium is Na. It has, we're going to write oxidation numbers. Remember, you got to write it as a, as a uh, superscript. Sodium has one electron that it needs to get rid of. Well, oxygen has to take in two. All right has to take in two electrons. So for, in order for these to bond, it, you can't just say, well, one sodium would bond with one oxygen. No, that wouldn't work because oxygen needs two in order to have a full outer shell. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a crisscross method. So we're going to take this number. Don't worry about the charge. Uh, we get Sometimes kids get so lost in the charge, positive or negative. It doesn't matter for this purposes for writing a bond. We're going to take this one, and we're going to move it down here. And we're going to take this two, and we're going to move it down here. So for sodium and oxygen to bond, what has to happen is it would have to take two sodium to bond 
which is one oxygen. All right. Here's a here's a dot model of this uh, electron dot model. So if sodium, uh, once again, an ionic bond is when they transfer electrons. The sodium will become positive because it's losing that electron, and the oxygen is going to become negative because it's gaining an electron. But you can see it doesn't have a full outer shell. Even if it takes that takes that electron from sodium, it only has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It has seven in its outer shell. So that's why it needs a second sodium atom to go and bond. All right, that sodium atom. All right, so that sodium atom then will become positively charged, and the oxygen will become have a negative two charge. And what you want to make sure when you're looking at this is that uh, every time the, the overall compound should be neutral. All right, so like when the overall formula should be neutral. So you have, uh, you can see oxygen is going to gain two, two negative electrons, or two, yeah, two electrons, that's redundant. Um, but the, the sodium is going to have, uh, it's only going to lose one, but there's going to be two of them. All right, so you can see the overall charge. So it takes two sodium atoms, two positive charges, to equal the one negative charge that is from, or excuse me, the one oxygen atom that has a negative two charge. So basically your charges, if you add them up, you have a plus, a plus, that's two pluses, and then you have uh, negative two. The overall compound needs to be the same. All right? So your oxidation numbers need to equal zero when you, when you write this formula. And so to write, uh, once again, to write lithium nitride. All right, so lithium, uh, if you're wondering, like, how the heck did he get these oxidation numbers? Lithium has one in its outer shell. If it can lose that, it'll have a full outer shell, so it's going to become a positively charged ion. Nitrogen has five in its outer shell, but it is, ooh, all right, so put your finger on nitrogen. It's one, two, three spaces away from the nearest noble gas. So you, my finger goes on the atom I'm looking at, or the element, and then I count. So nitrogen has three electrons that it needs in order to have a full outer shell. All right, so then what we do is we take that number, we crisscross it down, take this number, crisscross it down. So if lithium and nitrogen were to form a bond, this is going to be their formula. All right, the formula would be um, three lithium atoms to one nitrogen atom. All right, so it would be Li3N. All right, and this is what the dot structure would look like. All right, once again, this might look confusing. Like, whoa, what the heck? So lithium has one electron in its outer shell. All right, it gives that to it the nitrogen atom, um, but then once again, nitrogen at that point doesn't have a full outer shell, so this lithium, it would other lithium atoms would be attracted to it, it would, the nitrogen is going to pull on those electrons more than the lithium will, because lithium doesn't have a very strong pull on its electrons, so the nitrogen will pull three electrons away from the lithium atom, the lithium will become positively charged, and that positive charge will be attracted to the negatively charged nitrogen atom, and they would be attracted and they would form a bond, so the nitrogen will have a negative three charge and you'll have three positively charged lithium atoms. All right, so once again, you want to make sure your charges are equal. So you can say, uh, if we want the, you know, obviously but when I write the oxidation numbers down, one and three, those aren't the same numbers, so I got to crisscross them. All right, same thing here with aluminum. Aluminum has to give up three. Oxygen can only take in two. So it would take two aluminum atoms to bond three oxygen atoms. Calcium and fluorine, once again, taking the two. Don't worry about the charges. Sometimes that gets confusing, the positives and the negatives. Calcium has two to give up, but fluorine can only take in one. All right, since fluorine can only take in one, it would take two fluorine atoms then to bond with one calcium. All right, and naming a compound an ionic bond is really not that difficult, um, but there are a couple things you have to know. Like one, um, we'll talk about a prefix when we talk about uh, covalent bond, but you really have to know what a suffix is and a root word. Suffix are, are letters you're going to put at the end of the word. The root of the word is really just the main part of the word. All right, so when we write an ionic bond, and this is all ionic bonds, you're going to write the name of the positive ion just normally. All right, so whatever that whatever the, uh, you can see I did that up here, whatever the metal is, you just write it as it is. So calcium, you just put calcium. That's it. There's nothing changed with that. So you write the name of the positive ion, and that goes first. So you always write the metal first. So if I gave you a formula, if I say, hey, here's CAF2, what's the name of that formula? Well, it's got calcium, so I would write calcium, and then 
to write, I wouldn't say calcium fluorine because that makes it sound like it's two separate elements. What you do to signify that it is part of a compound, instead of just saying calcium fluorine, okay, those are individual elements, but calcium fluoride is a part of a compound. So I add the IDE, I keep the root of the word the same. All right, you can see the floor, but instead of adding the INE, I add fluoride. I add an IDE, and that tells us that it's part of a compound. So like oxygen, so aluminum, it wouldn't be oxygenide. All right, you just keep the root of the word, and then you're going to take the end of it off, and you're going to make it, so it be aluminum oxide. Phosphorus, we're going to keep the root of the word, phos. Phos, phos, root word, and then I'm adding an IDE. So phosphorus becomes phosphide. Nitrogen becomes nitride. Instead of nitrogenide, you're keeping the root of the word, nitri, ni, and then add an IDE. Nitride, phosphide. Sulfo becomes sulfide. All right, and so once again, I'm just taking out the end of the word and adding an IDE. All right, so that is really all you do when you write a compound. So when I, when I ask you and I say, hey, what's the, write this formula, and I say calcium fluoride, and you're like, I don't know where fluoride is on the periodic table. Yeah, it's because it's not on there. Fluorine's on there, but when it's part of a compound, it becomes fluoride. All right, aluminum oxide, lithium nitride. All right, that IDE tells you that it's part of a compound and not just an individual element. All right, so when you're writing a chemical bond, if I give you a formula, you just got to write the positive metal regular and then make sure you you uh, um, change the root of the keep the root of the word and then add an IDE at the end all right now we're going to focus on covalent bonds now remember covalent compounds occur between two non-metals all right so that's when you're on the same side of the periodic table so we're talking about elements that are on the same side of the periodic table all right that's the easiest way to kind of remember it Elements that are on the opposite side, it's ionic. When you go to ionic opposite, ionic opposite, they're on opposite sides where you have your metals bonding with your nonmetals. Covalent is when they're on the same side of the periodic table. All right, now this is going to be a little bit different. It's actually easier to write the formulas out, but it's going to be different to, to name the compounds. All right, so, so far what we've learned, uh, here's an example of, of nitrogen and oxygen. Here's all the different ways. Because a covalent bond shares electrons, there's a ton of different ways that you can write. They can, there's double bonds and triple bonds and single bonds. They can share one, two, three pairs of electrons. Covalent bonding gets a little bit more complicated uh, because they can, they're sharing electrons. It's not a transfer where it's like, hey, I need two, you have two, let's transfer. Now it's more of a sharing, and they can share and form multiple bonds. Uh, which, like I said, gets kind of confusing. So, like, here's an example of nitrogen. You have N2O, uh, NO, NO2, N2O5. All right. Based on the number of uh, electrons that they're sharing at a time, that, that's all the different ways nitrogen and oxygen can form bonds. And so the way we would learn that so far uh, is just, oh, that's nitrogen oxide. No, well, which one, though? There's, there's nitrous. There's all different. Those are all different things. And so what we do then... Uh, in chemistry, and this is with covalent bonds, all right, this is crucial. You do not use this with ionic bonds. So the first step you have to do when you're looking at a problem is, are they on the same side of the periodic table? If they are, it's a covalent bond. If they're on opposite sides, it's a, it's an ionic bond. The only exception is hydrogen, but hydrogen's a non-metal, and it's on typically in group one. That's the only exception to that. All right, so what we're going to do then is we have to know these Greek prefixes. All right, so you have to know these. I'm not going to give these to you. You have to know them. All right, so like mono, mono e mono, one on one. All right, mono is one. Die is two. Right, when you roll dice, you typically play a game with two dice. Three, uh, three is tri. Think of a tricycle, triangle, whatever. These are all pretty standard. That's three. Tetra is four. All right, penta. All right, there's, I think they're with the five counties. That's why penta county. There's five surrounding counties that feed into Penta, uh, so five pentagon, five. Hexa, hexagon has six sides. Hexa is six. Hepta is seven. Octa is eight. Uh, nana is is nine. I don't know if I ever get into that. I think it's, is it Nana or Nana? I don't know. Nana? I don't know. I'd have to actually look that up. It's great for notes, right? Uh, nana is nine, and then ten is Deca. 
So we do have to know the first ten. Typically, I won't ask you anything more than six, but we do have to know those. All right, so... Uh, all right, so here's an example. So if we have, like, like there's carbon and oxygen, one carbon bonding with one oxygen. Those are both on the same side of the periodic table. It's a covalent bond. So the way we would write that, uh, what you do is you use a Greek prefix. Now, you never write a one in front of, so if it's, if it's one carbon, you don't, that's the only time you don't use a prefix in front of the first one. You don't say monocarbon, all right, because it's redundant. If, if there's nothing there, you just don't say it. All right, you don't use it for the first one. All right, only if it's one. All right, I'll go into scenarios where it's not. If it's greater than one, you've got to put a Greek prefix there. So it would be carbon, and then one oxygen is carbon monoxide. All right, so you can see I put a mono in front of the oxygen, and that tells me carbon monoxide. I can look at this formula now and say, well, carbon monoxide, there's one carbon and one oxygen. I know there's one because of this Greek prefix, Greek prefix mono. All right, mono means one, mono e mono. Carbon monoxide. All right, and then if we're looking at two oxygen, one carbon and two oxygen, all right, once again, we can't call it carbon oxide because, well, is it monoxide? Uh, one oxide, well, that can't be monoxide, so there's one. So this one is, once again, we're using the Greek prefix there. We're going to put a die in front. So you're putting a uh, uh, prefix in front to say, hey, this is how many are attached. Carbon and oxygen are on the same side of the periodic table. It's covalent dioxide all right two oxygen now are being bonded with with the carbon all right and here we have four chlorine now so we have one carbon and four chlorine and we're also don't forget we're adding we're keeping the same thing we did with the ionic bond we're adding the ide that still tells us it's part of a compound it right, still tells us it's part of a compound and you're typically going to write when you write this out you're going to the element that is further right on the periodic table that's going to be the one that you are going to that is going to be the one that you're going to write second. All right, the, the one that's further left is going to be the one that you write first. So, so this one is four chlorine, so it would be carbon tetra chloride. Tetra is four, so I know there's four chlorine there. All right, and now here's, a, here's an example. Well, there's two nitrogen. Well, is it two nitrogen oxide? Oh, that's a zero. It should be a O. Oh. All right, so now since this number, the first element, is greater than 1, I'm going to put a di there. All right, so it's di-nitrogen, di-nitrogen, and then there's only one zero there, so I have to put, I always have to have a prefix with the second one. I always, even if it's 1, so it's di-nitrogen monoxide. All right, di-nitrogen monoxide would be the name of that one. All right, now I have one element, one element of nitrogen there. So that would just be nitrogen, and then same thing. All right, it's the same thing, monoxide. I have to put it if it's one for the second one. First one, I don't have to put one there. I put the second one I do. All right. All right, so here's the, uh, here's the rest of them. It says, uh, so we got nitrogen, one nitrogen, two oxygen. All right, so once again, one nitrogen, I don't have to put mono in front since it's the first one, but I always have to have a prefix on the second one. So it would be nitrogen dioxide. That means there's two oxygen bonded with one nitrogen. All right, so here we have two nitrogen, five oxygen. Now it's more than one on that first, so i got to put a di there. Di nitrogen, and then it's penta oxide. Penta means five oxygen. This would be diphosphorus penta oxide. Uh, and once again, so now we're back to the one so it'd just be phosphorus, not mono, just phosphorus, and there's three chlorine trichloride. 